This is the second video in a series about making an improved floppy disk system for the Altair computer while still only using parts that were available back at the same time as when the original Altair floppy disk system was designed. Now in the original video we did a demo towards the end where I had a side-by-side -side comparison of a computer running the new floppy disk system next to uh, Altair running the original floppy disk system. And to make that comparison as accurate as possible, so I was comparing apples to apples, I laid out the disk on the new system to be identical to the layout used in the original system, even made the contents and the order of everything the same. However, that is not necessarily the only or the best way to lay out the disk to get the best performance or whatever you might need out of this controller. So in today's video, we're going to look at a couple of other ways you might use the disk layout in the disk controller if you were really going to use this back in the day, let's say. All right, now if you haven't watched that original video, I'd really recommend watching it first. To help you find that, I've put a link to it in the description of this video. For the demos today, we're going to use this Altair 8800C computer. If you look in the end, you can see the new disk controller. As we talked about, it's very simple, just 12 ICs altogether. This compares to the 59 ICs and two circuit boards of the original Altair controller. Uh, from there, we have a 50-pin ribbon cable that runs down to our drive cabinet where we have two Shugart 800 drives. And the cabinet itself can be very simple because of this design. Just the two drives, a single power supply, and a fan, and that's about it. Again, we make up for the cost of the Shugart drives by saving money in other places. All right, to get started, what I'd like to do is first bring up what we were running at the end of the first video. Uh, we got that, it hit the bootstrap loader, hit run. All right, so we're up and running over here. All right, now again, since this duplicated the original Altair disk format, we can see how much space was on the original Altair disk format by doing a stat disk command. And here we see we have 300 kilobytes of capacity on the original Altair format, and this one I did to duplicate it. Now it's 300 as opposed to the 308 I mentioned in the previous video, because CPM doesn't include the first two tracks in that number. Uh, those first two tracks have the boot image of CPM, and it's not actually part of the CPM file system. So that's why that's 8 kilobytes lower. That's the size, roughly, of the two first tracks. Now, this 300 kilobytes compares very nicely to the 8-inch IBM soft sector standard. It only had about 244 kilobytes. So here we're getting about 23% more storage. And that is one advantage that the hard sector disk had over the IBM soft sector format. Why does it have more? Well, it's because there's 26 sectors per track on the IBM format as opposed to the 32 we have here. And that's because a soft sector format requires some data area for the soft sector ID fields. So you have ID fields for sectors, there's an ID field for the index, those need gaps after them before data fields and uh, before them. And that all adds up to using up more space on the disk for something besides the actual data. That's why it can't hold as much. And then on top of that, this IBM format was extremely conservative, uh, very large gaps. And what that meant is that it would work on most any drive, even if it wasn't perfectly aligned, even if the speed wasn't quite right. It would work with most any controller design, most any computer or piece of hardware you're using it with. It would just work. And because of that, it became a, a fairly popular archiving format for software and files, even after 8-inch drives weren't used that much, even after 5 and quarters had taken over. This IBM 3740 standard for 8-inch was still used often for archiving. All right, so you can see the obvious trade-off here is you have uh, reliability, forgiveness, but you lose some space, or you can get more space out of it, but then you require a bit more um, proper alignment and performance out of your drives. So with the 8-inch that um, Altair was using, with the 32 sectors, the 300 kilobytes, the drives had to be aligned pretty well and stay in alignment. And as we mentioned, that was a problem with those Pertec drives, which were just sheet metal for them, especially the index alignment, which again is directly affected by how much data or how tightly it is packed on the disk. Now in that last video, you may remember that I said I could actually get another 19% more than the 300K or so out of what I did. And so what I'd like to do next is go ahead and bring that up and show how that was actually achievable. Now we'll go ahead and load this higher capacity CPM I created. Examine the bootloader, hit run. 
And if you look at the sign on here, I gave it an innovative name. I called it Max Capacity Floppy Disk Controller. All right, so this version of CPM is fast, just like the ones I demonstrated at the end of the previous video. Um, if you were to load something big to really see the difference, MBASIC will load in about four seconds, like we saw last week. So it's up and running already. Uh, with standard lifeboat CPM that was available for the Altair, that took about nine seconds. So again, in general, this fast kind of CPM we have here is about twice as fast overall for most all your disk operations, which most commands do something to the disk, so you feel that frequently as you work on these systems. Um, now, in addition to also having the same performance as the fast CPM we demonstrated, if we look at the disk capacity, you'll see I've got 356 kilobytes as opposed to 300. And this compares about, uh, let's see, what's that, 19%, 18, almost 19% more than the Altair drives had at 300 and about 46% more than the IBM. So that's very good to have all that extra storage. And on top of this, this has two and a half times more um, gap space after sector holes to allow for more variance in the drive. So it's actually more forgiving on top of that. So obvious questions gotta be in your head right now is if 300K was tight causing the Altair drives to have problems, how did I get 19% more and increase the amount of slop allowed by a factor of two and a half times. That doesn't make any sense. Um, in addition, you're probably wondering, how can just software make this machine twice as fast on average as they were typically going to be in the day? How, how is that possible? Um, the answer to both of these questions is actually for the same reason. And that is because in the drivers, in the BIOS, I use track buffering. Track buffering with these early floppy disk drives was the simplest way to get maximum performance out of these drives. It's actually a simpler driver, simpler code than pretty much any other level of blocking and deblocking, other than having no blocking or deblocking at all, of course. Um, so your first thought may be, well, yeah, but you're wasting a lot of memory and that's always a trade-off. And yes, it is a trade-off. However, with these early drives, the track buffers were quite small, just 2K to a little bit over 4K. And in your typical 56 or 60K CPM system, it's rare that that last 4K would make a difference in something you were doing. Um, whereas every single command you type, it's roughly twice as fast on average. You're gonna notice that all the time. If you're like me, I would definitely pick that speed over that little bit of space uh, almost any time. Now, if space was just super critical, there's always the, use, um, always the opportunity to use boards that were bankable. These came out in 1977 before CPM was really mainstream. It was just starting to take off, for example. And with that, you could put your track buffer hidden from the address space altogether. It would take up none of the address space. And in fact, you could move some of your BIOS code onto that bankable memory board and actually shrink the footprint of CPM to be smaller than it would be with a regular BIOS with no buffers whatsoever. Um, so that was an option as well. Um, so again, how did I get this extra space then? I see how you run it faster. How'd you get the extra space? Well, since, <clears throat> excuse me, all the drivers are going to be track buffered, all the BIOS I write, it'll be track buffered. There's really no reason to divide this thing up into arbitrary length sectors and waste space between sectors. So I eliminated all the space between sectors, which of course then frees up lots of space to add more data and to increase the gap after the index mark. And as you might guess, I don't need 32 hard sectors on my disk anymore like the typical hard sector disk. I just need one index mark because I only have one sector per track. It's the entire track. So technically, I've been using a soft sector disk. Nothing to do with being soft sector. It's just that I need one index hole per revolution. And that is the way you get more space out of this and have more space after the index hole. Um, so to top that off, then you realize, well, if I'm not keeping track of sectors, I don't really need a sector register on my board. I don't really need logic to separate sector holes from index holes. And all that logic can be removed from the board, which as you might have guessed, I did remove that from my boards. That's one thing I saved on in addition to all the timers I mentioned. Um, but you may be in the back of the class raising your hand right now saying, hey, wait a minute. You said that this board could do anything the original one could do. What if I had to or wanted just to do plain old sector level I.O.? I didn't want to do the buffering. I needed sector level I.O. 
you've taken away the sector register, so you can't do it. Well, actually, that's not true at all. In fact, it's actually quite simple. Um, other manufacturers ended up doing this. Heathkit, for example, and others. No sector register whatsoever, and um, it'll work just fine. So let's go ahead and uh, shut this down and take off and look at um, a hard sector version of this, even though I have no sector registers, and see how that works. For all the demonstrations I've done of this new floppy disk system so far, I've used a disk similar to the one here, where if you look in that index hole in the jacket, you see there's one hole and that's it. There's just the one hole for the full rotation. And that, of course, you would consider to be a soft sector disk. Or you could consider it to be a hard sector disk if you only have one sector uh, per track, which, as I mentioned, that's what we've been doing all along. Um, but for this demonstration, where we're actually going to do sector level I.O., 32 sectors, we're going to use a hard sector disk like you see here. You can see all the holes going by. Those mark every sector, and then there's one additional hole that marks a full rotation or an index hole. So this is the same 32 sector uh, hard sector disk that the Altair uses, and this will be how we demonstrate that we can do hard sector I.O. Um, with 32 sectors on this, and no track buffering at all if you really wanted to. All right, let's examine the disk boot loader and hit run, and it's up and running. So for this one, I gave it the title of 32 sector right there so that we know this is basically doing the same thing as a uh, as the original Altair, 32 hard sectors, no track buffering or anything like that. All right, so again, it operates like you would normally expect. It's um, a little bit slower than what we've been seeing, again, because this no longer has the track buffering. This will be basically the exact same speed as the Lifeboat CPM that was available for the Altair back in the day. Again, you can really see it when we try loading something big. Here we'll load MBASIC. Uh, we were watching this load in just about four seconds with the track buffered uh, BIOSes. Here it's taking closer to about nine seconds to get loaded. So again, that track buffering does speed things up a bit for you. All right, if you look how big the disk is, you can see that we're back to the 300K here, just like the original Altair. And that's, of course, because we can no longer use the gap space between those sectors and cram it all into one large track, uh, sector on the track. We now have to have gaps between the sectors. So yeah, the maximum we can get out of this is the 300 kilobytes. So at this point, yeah, we have a basically a normal CPM, and it works at the same speed and uses the same amount of memory as the Lifeboat CPM that we saw in the previous video as our reference point from the late 1970s. Uh, so the question now is, well, how do you do this if you don't have a hardware sector register to keep track of where you are on the disk? And the answer is it's really quite simple. Um, in addition to the data in a sector, there was typically a few metabytes of data um, stored in each sector as well. That would include a checksum that had to be read in order to verify you read the data properly. And it was pretty common to include a track number um, on each and every sector as well. That way, after a seek was done, any read, you could find out if you were on the right track. And if not, you could do a restore to track zero and re so you can get things back in sync. And it was also pretty common to include a sector byte. That way you knew you were on the right sector. Which begs the question, if you know you're on the right sector by reading the disk, and that is the piece of information that controls the situation, why do you even need to read it off of a hardware register? A soft sector controller basically does this. It reads the sector ID and gets the track and sector out of it to know if it's the right sector to work on. We can do the exact same thing here. Now, in a soft sector controller, there's a special missing clock pulse sequence that defines the sector ID so you know it's not normal data. We don't have that kind of extra hardware and capability in these hard sector controllers, but instead we have a, a hard sector mark, a, an index hole. So when the index hole comes, we know to then go read that sector. If that sector reads properly and it has the right sector number, we're done. Otherwise, you just keep scanning just like a software sector, I mean a software um, soft sector controller would do, or just like you would have done with a, a hardware sector register. You, it basically only updates as each sector passes under the head. It's not like it's any faster. You can read the whole disk track just as quickly as you can wait for the right sector to come under the head. So in essence, we're doing the same thing as the soft sector controller by looking for the sector number as data. 
and then we use the hard sector index to tell us when to start looking at each uh, sector mark. So um, it's actually quite simple, really no different than using sector register. The only slight twist is of course writing. In a soft sector controller, it reads the sector mark. Then there's a large gap that allows it to have enough time to turn around, turn on the right head, have everything get up to current and start writing. Uh, we don't have that kind of space here because we got 32 sectors per track, not just 26. And so what you have to do is seek for the sector prior to the one you're writing. So we sit there and um, set the hunt sector to be N minus one, so to speak. When we got that, then we just write the next sector, which will be the right one. All right, so that does it. This, uh, this controller can work multiple ways. Uh, if I was gonna use this, I would pick the, uh, the track buffered version that's nice and fast that has the maximum capacity. Uh, that demonstration where I made it exactly the same layout as the Altair, there's no real benefit to that because it doesn't have interchangeable discs. It's just the layout's the same, but they are used differently. So you couldn't swap those two discs between two systems. Obviously you don't have 32 hard sectors uh, the way I did it. So yeah, you, you couldn't swap between the two. Um, and then this version that you see here might be something you had to do if you just had no extra RAM space whatsoever and had to just make that BIOS as small as possible and didn't have room for that track buffer. All right, this has been a very fun project. I don't know what else I could possibly do with it or what I'm gonna do with this board, but it's, um, it was a good chance for me to learn KiCad more fully, which uh, will now help me moving on to other projects and maybe I'll come up with some other boards I can make.